We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together. Our chalice lighting is by Cooper Garrett. Oh, divine love, with the kindling of this flame, may we realize and love our true selves, our true round belly selves, our true bags under our eyes selves, our true naturally hairy selves, our true wrinkles on our skin, selves. May our self-love help keep our chalice ablaze. Now if you would please stand as you are able and let's sing hymn number 352, Find a Stillness. Still, 
story is called The Wisdom of the Dawn by Patrick Fishman. Long ago, an old teacher assembled his students and other young people from the village. I have something to, I wish to entrust you with so that you will take care of it, he said. The sound of whispering could be heard spreading throughout the gathering. Each person was ready to watch over the teacher's treasure. They were all expecting to see a small box or a book or a precious object, but it is not a material thing that I want to entrust you with, said the teacher. It's a question, a simple question for you to preserve, nurture, and cherish. When can you be really certain that the night is over and the dawn is breaking? Hmm, when the first ray of light appears, asked one student. When the rooster crows, suggested another. When you can tell the difference between a sheep and a dog, or an olive tree from a jujube tree? None of these, said the teacher. You can be certain that the night is really over and the dawn is breaking when you see a stranger coming and you know, without a doubt, that they are your sibling. At that moment, we are enlightened. The person who learns from everyone is wise. Let us sing this children out. For you shall go out in joy for you shall go out in joy and come back in peace and come back in peace Blessed be. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas environmental action, income inequality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's plate recipient is Michigan Urban Farming Initiative, MUFI. MUFI uses urban agriculture as a way to promote education, sustainability, and community by empowering people living in urban settings, solving many social problems facing Detroit, and developing a model for other urban communities. 
MUFI's primary focus is the redevelopment of a three-acre area in Detroit's North End, which is being positioned as an epicenter of urban agriculture. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Will the ushers please come forward? We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Each week, we set aside time to reflect on personal joys and sorrows shared by our fellow congregants. Joys and sorrows may be shared via the BUC website or by writing them in the book at the back of the sanctuary. Today, we have a joy shared by our Reverend Mandy Beal. Reverend Mandy says, it is a great joy to officiate my best friend's wedding in North Carolina this weekend. This comes on the heels of leaving my grandmother's funeral in Texas last weekend. I am grateful for the outpouring of support from our beloved community and look forward to being with you again soon. Melinda Henderson also shares a joy. Melinda says, George and I are pleased to announce the marriage of a daughter and stepdaughter, Anna Zambelli, to her high school sweetheart, Michael Linden, on October 3rd. It was a beautiful ceremony celebrating an 11 year relationship and it made for a relaxing and joyful day. <laughs> Linda also had a sorrow to share. On a sad note, George and I lost our brother-in-law tragically and fairly suddenly this past month. Please keep wife and daughter, Maria and Anastasia in your prayers. Let us take a moment to acknowledge our private joys and sorrows, those we hold close to our hearts. If you feel so moved, please speak the names of those on your heart this day.
Now please join me in a moment of prayer and meditation with a prayer written by Alex Klinger Klingerberg. Spirit of life, earth, and sea, and sky, place of deep longing in my heart, find your way from silence to voice. Give me strength and courage to speak truth through my life, for I am a creature of the universe, small but infinite, a momentary body in the sea of life, and also the sea itself. I am a gathered bit of energy and one who gathers, a creation and a creator. Let me not hold too tightly to one form and lose the other, for we are not form but process, ever changing and ever renewing. Help us see that we are neither the beginning nor the end, but something perfectly natural and imperfectly di divine. Now let's have a silent, uh, a time for silent prayer or meditation. The focus of today's service is the question, who am I, really? This past week, we asked congregants to share anonymous statements describing aspects of their own self-identities. We received 32 unique submissions. Each statement begins with the words, I am, or I have. Here are some of our statements of identity in random order. I am an introvert. I have fundraised hundreds of thousands of dollars. I am more visual than verbal, and what I see matters. I am a flower lover and gardener. I am a teacher and mentor. I am proud of the men my sons have become. I am a great aunt of three and delighted to have lived long enough. I am an older adult seeking a positive identity as an elder. I am queer. I have my strongest grief and memories at Christmas time. I have a love of learning new things. I am a retired nurse. I am a lifelong social worker focused on the rights of those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I have three grandchildren. I am a graduate student. I am schizophrenic. 
I am a strong support to many people. I am so in love with my husband. I am a gardener. I am a dad and grandpa, and I love being both. I have many secrets. I seek connections with positive, life-giving, forward-focused people. I choose hope over despair. I am a human in process with much work left to do. I adore my family. I am loving and giving. I am a member of living by heart. I have children. I am a spiritual seeker. I have a musical gift. I am taking a medication for anger issues. I am and am not the same person every day. The first part of today's reading comes from Stephen Batchelor's Buddhism Without Beliefs. Reality is intrinsically free because it is changing, uncertain, contingent, and empty. It is a dynamic play of relationships. Awakening to this reveals our own intrinsic freedom. As long as we are locked into the assumption that self and things are unchanging, unambiguous, absolute, opaque, and solid, we will remain correspondingly confined, alienated, numbed, frustrated, and unfree. In practice, life cannot be so neatly split into the dualities of free and unfree awakened and unawakened. While such categories are clear-cut, life is ambiguous. Awakening is the recovery of that awesome freedom into which we were born, but for which we have substituted the pseudo-independence of a separate self. No matter how much it frightens us, no matter how much we resist it, such freedom is right at hand. It may break into our lives at any time, whether we seek it or not, enabling us to glimpse a reality that is simultaneously more familiar and more elusive than anything we have ever known, in which we find ourselves both profoundly alone and profoundly connected to everything. Yet the force of habit is such that suddenly it is lost again and we are back to unambiguous normality. Through counteracting this force of habit, Dharma practice has two objectives. To let go of self-centered craving so that our lives become gradually more awake and to be receptive to the sudden interruption of awakening into our lives at any moment. Thank you, Stephen Batchelor. According to some UUA materials I read, we Western Buddhists host a variety of perspectives and bring them all to Unitarian Universalism. They go on to say, as with all faith, faith traditions encompassed in Unitarian Universalism, it is impossible to describe UU Buddhism in terms of any one perspective. It is a rich and varied thing we bring to Unitarian Universalism. And the joy for me is that even as I am transformed by my life as a Unitarian Universalist, 
I am beginning to see ways in which Unitarian Universalism is transformed by our Buddhist presence. No one knows where this meeting of East and West in our Unitarian Universalist congregations will lead. Certainly, only time will tell. But the journey is already wonderful and filled with splendid possibilities for the self. The song I'm about to play was one of the first I ever wrote back in high school. I had become fascinated with the power of science to answer big questions, but I was puzzled by its inability to answer certain types of questions, like the nature of God or the meaning of life. My idea was to compose a song focused on this apparent boundary between science and religion that had a funky bass line and a call and response structure inspired by African American spirituals. Um, you can still hear some of that structure in the guitar part, um, assuming I can play it right. Um, however, I haven't shared the song in public before, mostly because it reveals some uncomfortable things about my own personal spiritual journey. I'm struck by the narrow theological viewpoint and black and white moral code of my youth. Uh, but more than anything else, I'm struck by the religious question I chose to focus on, which reveals some deep insecurities about my own personal identity and my own sense of self-worth. And I still struggle with those insecurities, and that's the part of this song that most resonates with me. Uh, the song is titled, Why Do You Love Me? Oh, I already know why a tree grows Sky. And I can understand how a bird can learn to fly. I learned so long ago why waves traverse the sea. So why can't I explain why you still love me? And why do you love me? Oh Lord, why do you care? With all I've done, Not exactly saintly, there's so much that I've done wrong. You said to love my rivals, but Lord, you know I'm not that strong. And when you call my name, I can't hear what you say. But when I've done my worst, you come and wash my sin away. transition for that part. <laughs> Who am I, really? On its surface, this seems like a simple question. I am Tom Raffle, of course. But Tom is just a name, 
and who am I really is anything but a simple question. Indeed, the further I got into writing this sermon, the more I realized that I'd bitten off more than I could really chew. Even defining my physical self is far from straightforward. Am I defined by my body, a collection of millions of interdependent cells all working together? Some of those cells are white blood cells, which I can separate out from a blood sample and watch moving around on their own under a microscope, doing their own thing. Are those semi-independent cells part of my sense of self? Maybe not, even though they came from my own body. However, I doubt most people think of immune cells when they contemplate the concept of self or self-identity. Our first UU principle focuses on the inherent worth and dignity of every person, elevating the importance of valuing people as individuals. Our fourth principle emphasizes our responsibility as individual seekers of truth and meaning. And who am I really is one of the most frequently asked questions by people as they move along their individual spiritual paths. A closely related question is, what makes me special as a unique individual? So I ask myself, who am I really? How do I define myself? Am I defined by my mind? by the patterns of interconnected neurons and electrical signals that characterize my consciousness? Am I defined by specific personality characteristics or preferences? Am I defined by the family I belong to, or the town I live in, or the job I work at, or the church I attend? Those questions are fundamentally important to the human experience as shown by the central role they play in many popular myths and legends. This is especially true for adventure stories, where the hero's voyage of self-discovery may be as or more important than their physical journey. In the greatest animated film ever made, and that's not up for debate, the emotional climax of the film is not for me when the title character achieves her goal, no. Instead, the part of Moana that gets me choked up every time is when she reflects on all the amazing things she's learned about herself. Our hero says, who am I? I'm a girl who loves my island and the girl who loves the sea. It calls me. I am the daughter of the village chief. We are descended from voyagers who found their way across the world. They call me. I've delivered us to where we are. I have journeyed farther. I am everything I've learned and more. Still, it calls me. And the call isn't out there at all. It's inside me. It's like the tide always falling and rising. I will carry you here in my heart. You'll remind me that come what may, I know the way. I am Moana. Questions about self-identity and how we should go about answering them are central to many world religions. Judeo-Christian traditions teach that each person inhabits a physical body, but that our true selves, our souls, are spiritual beings that pre-existed our bodies and persist after death. Some Christians take a negative view of this true self as being fundamentally separated from God by the original sin of our ancestors with a need to come closer to God through faith, penance, and service. Many Western philosophers have retained this Judeo-Christian concept of a true self as some sort of fundamental and stable entity that underlies our physical and mental selves. For example, Sigmund Freud postulated a three-part definition of self separated into an unconscious biological id, a conscious and rational ego, and an internalized sense of social awareness that he called the superego. I personally have become skeptical of this Western concept of the true self. What if my self isn't a distinct and stable entity at all? What if who I really am is constantly changing and evolving throughout my lifetime? This certainly seems to be true for my physical self, comprised of body cells that die and are replaced by new cells to such an extent that few cells from my childhood still remain in my adult body. What about the version of, version of myself defined by my personal preferences and choices? 
Is there anything distinct or stable about that guy? Well, Dumbledore told Harry Potter that we are most defined by the choices we make, and that idea still rings true for me years after I first read it. However, I made choices in my past that directly contradict the preferences, and in some cases, the deeply held convictions of my adult self. For example, I hated pickles as a child, but I love them now. Am I the same self as the child who hated pickles? I think not. Maybe more significantly, am I really the same self who as a teenager thought he was doing God's work by trying to convert an atheist friend to Christianity? That's not a choice I would make anymore. Has my personality changed so much through the years that in some real sense I'm not quite the same person anymore? I would like to believe the answer is yes, because my adult self is somewhat repelled by that previous version of myself, who thought converting my friend to Christianity was more important than respecting his unique spiritual journey. I take comfort in the words of Gautama Buddha. Just as a snake sheds its skin, we must shed our past over and over again." End quote. Who am I is a tough question to answer in any definitive way. And sometimes I wonder if this question is on some level meaningless. What if my sense of having an individual self is an illusion created by my conscious mind to make sense of its own existence? The Buddhist tradition brings us a very different take on the concept of self than that of Western philosophy. The central Buddhist concept of non-self or anatman teaches that a person's conception of themselves as having an underlying and unchanging true self is nothing more than an illusion created by the mind. Buddha said, we live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. We are that reality. When you understand this, you see that you are nothing, and being nothing, you are everything. This Buddhist pr perspective is not so different from that provided us by modern neuroscience, which teaches us that human consciousness is an emergent property of the vast neural network within our brains. In this sense, everything that makes us, us, all our memories and preferences and habits, all our perceptions of the outside world and conceptions of how the world works are created by and for our own brains. As Buddha said, we are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world." End quote. A reasonable person might ask at this point, well, if who am I is such a difficult question to answer, and maybe there is no such thing as a true self, and maybe even my perception of myself as a single conscious entity is an illusion, then why should we even care? Why did Moana's grandmother ask her, do you know who you are? And why were audience members like me so entranced by her answer? For me, this question is important because it is inextricably tied to an even more fraught question. Why should I believe my life is meaningful? In other words, why should I believe that the UU first principle about the inherent worth and dignity of every person applies to me as well as to anyone else? Now, on a rational level, I believe firmly in the UU first principle, and I understand that logically it must apply to me as well as to anybody else. And yet, as revealed by the song I wrote in high school, I have sometimes struggled with doubts about my own self-worth. If you are like me, you might do well to heed another quote from Gautama Buddha. You yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. In times of struggle, I find it helpful to remind myself of parts of my life and persona that make it feel meaningful. I think that's why when I try to answer this question, who am I really, I think of things that give me a sense of my place in the world and a sense that my life has purpose and meaning. The leader of my church youth group once asked us teenagers to compose mission statements for our lives. My response was to bring knowledge to others. Amazingly, that statement still rings true as my own personal mission. 
Not surprisingly, then, I identify as an educator who teaches and mentors students, and as a scientist who seeks to publish discoveries for the benefit of a broader scientific community. But you might notice those statements also describe some of my connections with other people, with my students, with my colleagues. That's no coincidence, because there are few aspects of self-identity more meaningful than our personal relationships. Maybe the most important aspect of my self-identity is that I have been husband to Cindy Raffle for almost 10 years. Indeed, at this point, our lives are so intertwined that it is hard to think of my own identity in any meaningful way outside the context of our marriage. I am also a son and a brother and a cousin and a friend to many people. And those relationships are even more important to my sense of self than my identity as an educator. When Moana described core aspects of her identity, she started by describing her relationships with her island community, with her father, with her Voyager ancestors, and with the sea. And it is not any single relationship that gives Moana a sense of self. Instead, it is the intersection of all these aspects of her identity that makes Moana uniquely herself. Buddha said, he who experiences the unity of life sees his own self in all beings and all beings in his own self and looks on everything with an impartial eye. In my own life, I recognize similar gray areas that make me question my sense of self as being separate from the world I live in. In a very real sense, my individual self-identity is meaningless outside of the broader context of the interdependent web of existence of which my mind and body are but one part. There is a certain power to this perspective that I find comforting. I remind myself that my life is linked in meaningful ways to other people and to the communities and ecosystems that surround me. I remind myself that I like other living beings, have inherent worth and dignity. I remind myself that I too am worthy of being loved by other people and even by my God. I will leave you with one final quote from Gautama Buddha. It is better to conquer yourself than to win a thousand battles. Then the victory is yours. It cannot be taken from you. May it be so. Now please join us in singing our closing hymn, We Are, which is 1015 in the Teal Hymnal. that's born a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are for each child that's born a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are we are our grandmother's prayers and we are our grandfather And the sons of great visions, we're sisters of mercy and brothers of love. We are lovers of life and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages, we are.
each child that's born a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are for each child that's born a morning star rises and sings to the universe Go now into this world. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins to each other and to the wider world. Amen and blessed.